Commander, I'm Lieutenant Hazel. I'll be guiding you through the trials to determine if you're cleared for operations. The brass has their eyes on you, so try not to embarrass me. Let's get you familiar with the view controls first. Hold down the left mouse button and drag the mouse to angle your view. Now use the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. And most importantly, moving the view. Use W, A, S, and D to pan the view. E and C will raise and lower your view in the battle space, respectively. And that's it. Let's move on to the actual interface. We're going to select one of our ships now, so sit tight. You can select a ship either by clicking on its icon in the battle space, selecting it in the ship list, or pressing its corresponding number key indicated in the ship list. You've selected a ship. Now if you want to focus your view on the ship, you can use the F key. You can also do this by double tapping the ship's number key to both select and focus on the ship at the same time. When focused, your view will automatically track the selecting unit until you move the view. This ship in particular is the Reigns class frigate. It's the most common warship in the fleets, with a generous balance of speed, agility, armoring, and some good room for a good mix of support modules and weapon systems. You'll also see at the bottom of the screen a readout of the selected ship. This is the ship information bar, and it's a list of the status of modules, weapons, current orders, and the general posture of the warship. This window is the damage control status board, and it'll be one of the most important items when in battle, as it shows the condition of all modules on the ship as a color gradient. Green means functional and undamaged, while red means heavy damage. A destroyed module or weapon is indicated in gray. Damage control is a whole can of worms, so we won't be covering that for now. Let's move on. Next, the mount status display. This shows the status of all external mounts on the hull, which could be weapons, defense systems, or utilities. Currently, all of our mounts show green with a black slash, indicating they're operational, but idle. If you're ever confused at what a color or a symbol means, you can hover over the color status icon with your mouse to see what's going on. Lastly, we have the posture controls. These define how the ship will operate. From here, you can control maneuvers, which sensor systems are enabled, and toggle specific defensive systems. Right now, I've disabled most of these so we don't toggle something by mistake, but we'll go over these systems later. So you know how the interface works, but what about issuing an order to a ship? The ANS Small Beginnings is reporting that their drives are online, so we'll get that frigate into a nearby position. Select the ANS Small Beginnings and open the action menu by right-clicking anywhere in the battle space. On the left side of the menu, select the Move or Movement submenu to see all available movement commands. The POS or Position command will order the warship to move to a position and hold there. Select Position and move the small beginnings within 500 meters of Waypoint Atlas. This is the Dial widget, and it will allow you to accurately select position on the plane the ship is currently on by moving the cursor. You can left click to confirm an order, or right click to cancel. To change the elevation, Understood. hold left control and move your cursor up or down. You can also issue waypoints by holding left shift and marking a path. The order will only be confirmed when left shift is released and you click again. Don't forget, if you need to get a better view, you can still hold the left mouse button to angle your view even while the dial is open. When you're ready, lay in a course for the small beginnings to position itself near waypoint atlas. In the future, you can also use the M key as a shortcut to issue move to position orders. Now let's talk formations. Because only one ship can be commanded at a time, formations are crucial for grouping your forces and keeping management simple. The ANS Dusty Tome is reporting they're ready for orders, so we'll have them fall in with the small beginnings. 
select the Dusty Tome and open the Action menu. The Formation command can be found under the Move submenu and is issued with the FRM or Formation button. You can also use the keyboard shortcut Left Shift plus F key. Send traffic. We first have to designate a ship as the guide ship. This ship will be the actual leader for the formation, and all warships following the guide ship will try to copy their current orders. Select the ANS Small Beginnings to mark it as the guide. Next, you'll need to designate a position for the Dusty Tome to take up in formation. The dial functions exactly like the movement command, but it's relative to the guide ship. Pick a position for the Dusty Tome to keep station on. The Dusty Tome will move into formation, and they'll try to follow the guide ship as best they can. If the guide ship is moving when the ship is ordered to form up with it, the guide will automatically slow down to allow the other ship to catch up. You can have as many ships as you want in a formation, but keep in mind that there are drawbacks to having a lot of closely packed ships beyond white-knuckled helmsmen. Spacing is key, and sometimes you need to split up. Ships near each other create a larger radar return, making stealth and evasion more difficult and allowing the enemy to detect you at a longer range. But we won't go over sensor coverage just yet. You can see the structure of your fleet and its formations in the ship list, which dynamically updates to show which ships are in formation with each other. Orders can be issued to your entire formation at once by opening the action menu in formation mode. This can be done by using left shift plus right click with any ship in the formation selected. The action menu will indicate it's in formation mode by displaying the number of ships the order will be delivered to. For formation mode, don't worry about which ship you have selected as the order will be delivered to all of them. Easier that way. Movement orders are a special case, as they will always be routed to the guide ship and the whole formation will follow them. Now let's get the whole formation moving in a direction. The Drive Course command, found on the Move submenu as the CRS or Course button, will order a ship or formation to travel in a certain direction indefinitely. Select the Drive Course command now. Do not issue the order just yet. When it comes to picking directions in space, you'll use the Sphere widget. It's similar to the Dial widget from before, but allows for choosing directions more uniformly. It can be a little tricky at first, so take your time and get a feel for it. Moving your mouse cursor around will position the target on the surface of the sphere. By holding left control, you will log the direction and be able to change the radius. This is useful for weapons, as you'll see in a later lesson. But for choosing a course, we really only care about direction. Know that the cursor will remain on one side of the sphere, even if you pan the view. The initial size is determined by where your mouse was relative to the ship when you first opened the widget. If you need to switch the side, hold left control and draw the radius back through the center until it's on the opposite side. Get some practice moving the cursor around now, as selecting a direction or position in 3D space can be very disorienting at first. When you're ready, issue the order to get the formation underway in the given direction. We're on our way. The formation will now drive the course until told to do otherwise. Careful not to lose attention and let them get too far. We've had an incident in the past and I'm not going to fill out more paperwork. Lastly, let's break the Dusty Tome back off from the formation. To do so, all you need to do is select the ship and issue a standard movement order to it. That will override its order to keep in formation. Well, congratulations! That completes your first lesson in maneuvering ships in the battle space. We'll cover more advanced topics like weapons employment and tactical view in the next lesson. I'll see you back at the Academy. Now comes my favorite part, weapons and how to use them. 
don't worry about that red contract over in the distance. It's a decommissioned frigate that's been tugged out here for target practice. Before we get to weapons, we need to learn about the tactical view. You can switch between tactical and normal views by pressing spacebar. The view controls here are the same as before, but you can zoom out much further and get a better idea of the situation in the battle space. Take a moment to look around now. The tactical view provides you with a lot of information that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. It's your primary way of knowing what's happening around you. You'll be using it a lot. The range plane shows you both elevation of targets and their distance from a given point. When no ships are selected, it sits at the center of the battle space. Select the small beginnings now to see how the plane changes. Center traffic. Take note that the range plane moved to center on that ship. It'll also track with it. All ranges will be indicated relative to your currently selected ship. Notice how the line from the enemy track to the range plane has a slight curve. This is because elevation and range are not directly related, so the contact's distance on the plane must be projected onto a sphere. This layout makes it easy to determine the range of a target by looking at the position of the plane relative to your selected ship's capabilities. The dotted lines represent maximum ranges of your ship's systems. Red indicates offensive range, blue is sensor range, and defensive systems are green. While there are common ship configurations found throughout the fleet, most ships have some unique capability. The ANS Small Beginnings is configured with two Mark 62 twin barrel 120mm cannons and a 16 cell vertical missile launcher. I'm unlocking your weapon systems now, so let's put gunnery to the test with some tried and true naval fire. There are several ways to target weapons. The fastest and simplest is by shooting directly at the sensor track. To do this, right click the red sensor track to bring up the action menu in track mode. The action menu will indicate it is in track mode by displaying the targets and track number in the space. It will automatically open the weapons list if there are any weapons on the ship. The active targeting mode is shown at the top of the list. Right now we are in track mode indicated by TRK. We'll talk about other modes later. Select the cannons from the weapon list and light up the target. Engaging. Definitely seeing some hits there. Looking good. If the guns can't hit a target, the ship will automatically roll itself to get currently active weapon on angle on the target. This is called unmasking. Right now you'll notice that our fire is pretty inaccurate. This is because our targeting solution isn't using a fire control lock. The red dot jumping around near the track shows where our sensors think the target is. Let's improve our targeting accuracy by locking the target with our bullseye fire control radar, located on the top of the ship. To do this, right click the track and select the LCK, or lock, at the top of the action menu. You can also use the X key keyboard shortcut. Waiting orders, Commander. Locking target. Notice the new icon on the target. This indicates that the target is locked on and is providing much better accuracy and increased update rate on the target. Remember, not all ships have fire control radar, and you'll only be able to get a lock with ships that have them equipped. Right now we are shooting armor piercing, AP, shells at the target. Armor piercing is effective on armor plating, but will only deal damage to internal components directly in the shell's path once it punctures the hull. While any damage is a good thing, we can deal even more damage by switching the shell type to high explosive, dealing damage to a wide area in the target's internals. We use high explosive, HE shells, against targets of appropriate size or smaller, or larger targets with heavy armor damage. HE shells cause much less damage to armor, but penetration will explode inside and do damage to all nearby components and personnel. 
To switch to HE shells, first open the action menu in track mode by right clicking the track. In the weapons list, next to the cannons entry, click on the ammunition icon to open the ammunition list. Click the 120mm HE shell option to select it. The ammo switch is now pending and will only be executed if a new fire order is given. To begin firing the new ammo type, click the weapon group to confirm the ammunition change. Engaging. Now we'll select the small beginnings and watch what it's up to. The mounts display shows the ship's cannons are firing and cycling. When the yellow bar is filled, the cannon will fire again. We can also see that the fire control's radar is solid green, indicating it's active and it has an active lock-on. Here's the active orders list, showing an icon for each order the ship is currently executing. Right now we have an order to fire our guns and an order to lock the target. Have the small beginnings hold fire and break their lock on by right clicking on the order icons to cancel them. And that's the basics of gunnery. The key thing is to know what ammunition to use, especially as your target takes more damage to warrant the big stuff. But what if you don't have a sensor track? Take a look at your ship's hulls and you'll notice the four white octagons on the sides. These are radar panels and provide coverage for their respective sector of space. There's also a central control module inside the ship which tracks what these panels see. When panels are damaged or destroyed, you'll lose coverage in that area. Similarly, if the radar controller is destroyed, you'll lose all coverage in all directions. Obviously, fighting blind is not a good thing. But that won't put you out of the fight just yet. Direct fire weapons like cannons can fall back on visual targeting, where the crew will provide targeting data to your guns using onboard optics. Some weapons like missiles can't do this, however. I've ordered your crew to disable the radar. Take a moment and observe what happens. You don't want the first time you're operating without radar to be the real deal. With sensors disabled, you will now see visual contacts when you have one of your ships selected, and nothing when no ship is selected. Visual contacts are only useful to the ship that actually sees the target, unlike the sensor track, which was shared across all ships. If you don't see anything, you'll need to move within visual range, about 3200 meters. I've created a marker in the general area for your reference. That won't happen in actual battle. You can fire on visual contacts the same way you did with the sensor tracks. Use visual targeting to fire at the target ship with the small beginnings guns again. Standing by. Firing on that target. In a situation like this, you can imagine things are not going too well for you. But you'll at least still be a threat, so don't feel too cut up if your sensors go dark. Now missiles. The ships in this fleet carry two variants of the SGM-2 series anti-ship cruise missiles, the Thunderhead and the Hurricane. 
The Hurricane is a command-guided missile, which means it is guided to the target by a launching ship. If it misses the target, it will come back around and try again until it runs out of fuel, is shut down, or finally hits the target. Command missiles are very difficult to avoid. The only way to defeat them without destroying the missile itself is by destroying the launching ship or jamming its sensors or communication. Shoot the archer, as we say. The downside is that the hurricane must be shot at a sensor track. If you lose a track, the hurricane will be useless. Let's launch three hurricane missiles at the target. Start by opening the action menu in track mode on the target. Now select the SGM-225 Hurricane with the weapons list. This will queue up a single missile shot at the target and leave you with an active track selection widget. Multiple missiles can be fired with a single order using the left alt key. Hold the left alt key and click on the target to add one more missile per click. The number of queued missiles is shown next to your mouse cursor. To issue the order, you can either click the left mouse button with the left alt key released, or you can press the enter key. Launching missiles. Once you've issued a launch order, you'll notice the mount status display will show the number of missiles that are being spun up for a launch. It takes time between when the target is selected and when the missile actually leaves the ship. This warm-up time is when the weapons control system brings the missile online, checks it for errors, establishes a reference frame for the IMU, uploads the target package, and more. Programming time varies by missile type, with more complicated missiles taking more time. The number of missiles that can be warmed up and programmed at the same time is referred to the ship's maximum salvo size, and it varies from ship to ship based on its configuration. These two frigates each have four channels, so four missiles can be fired at a time. Missiles are one of your most limited and precious resources, second only to the ships themselves. They are extremely powerful, but extremely scarce. You'll need to know when to use them, as it can't be replenished under normal circumstances outside of a port. A frigate like the Reigns will be crippled by only two or three missile hits, but in a real fight it will often take more than that to penetrate an enemy's point defense, which are a serious threat to hurricanes as they tend to fly in a direct path. The ANS Dusty Tome is carrying a different missile loadout. Select the ship now so we can take a look at it. Ready. This frigate is carrying Thunderheads, an active radar-guided missile, which means it carries its own method for finding targets, allowing it to seek targets by itself. It can be targeted in the same way as the Hurricane missiles, but once it has left the tube, it's entirely autonomous. When it reaches the end of its path, it will activate its onboard seeker and begin searching for a target. The greatest benefit of active missiles is that they can be sent on complex waypoint paths, allowing for multi-angle strikes and even hitting targets behind asteroids but we'll cover that when you get to your advanced missile trials. For now, let's just fire three Thunderhead missiles at the target as we did before with the Hurricanes. As easy as it is to use active radar missiles, there are some downsides to their operation. The first is that the missile must find a target within the cone of its seeker in order to track and kill it. This makes evasive maneuvers such as course changes an easy way to defeat active missiles fired at long range, especially against fast moving targets. The second shortcoming is that active seekers are easy to decoy with chaff and other countermeasures meaning more missiles need to be used in order to score a hit as active missile radars are particularly sensitive to jamming and decoys. But that should do it for your weapons trial. I'll have Fleet Logistics retrieve the dummy ship, and I recommend looking into all the weapons when you get your chance. I'll see you at the Academy. Alright, ready for something really nerve-wracking? For as long as you're out here in space, it's inevitable that you're going to take a few hits over the course of your career. In reality, the odds of us coming out of unscathed of an engagement are exceedingly low. 
If you want to stay fit and combat effective, you're going to need to learn how to repair damage. Let's begin. To start, select the ANS Small Beginnings. I've had my boys set up some simulated scenarios for us to cover. Just stay cool, you'll start seeing some damage come up. For the purpose of this training exercise, I've just simulated damage in three of the Small Beginnings subsystems. Mount 1, the Main Radar Controller, and the Combat Information Center. In the ship list, you'll notice a number of new icons have appeared. The orange number indicates the number of damage components with active debuffs, which affects the performance of those damage components. If there's a fire, it will be indicated here. Obviously, a fire in an enclosed space is a serious threat to ship survival. It'll slowly damage the ship over time, and it'll also slow down the working speed of damage control teams. This red number indicates the components have been damaged to the point where they are no longer functional. This also includes components which have been completely destroyed. The red chevrons indicate the ship's command system are not operational, meaning they are no longer receiving any orders. Open the action menu to see what it looks like. The text at the center of the action menu will display not receiving when a ship can't receive orders. This is because the CIC, or Combat Information Center, has taken critical damage. You may have warships with backup command systems that allow maneuvering orders to be carried out while the CIC is disabled. This allows you to get your ship to safety and effect repairs. However, this ship isn't fitted with that. Going back to the ship's status display, we can see the damaged components and their locations. By clicking on the status display, we can open the damage control board. Do so now. The damage control board will show all of the components installed on the ship and their current status. You can use the filter buttons at the top to suppress things that you don't want to see. Copy command, we can hear you again. Your damage control officer will automatically prioritize repairs based on how important a component is. For example, your reactor and CIC are going to be priority one, as they're critical to the operation of the ship. If you have your own priorities, you can click on one of the items on the board to prioritize it manually. Prioritize items are highlighted in blue. Keep in mind that changing priorities frequently can cause teams to move around a lot, which wastes valuable time that could be used for repairs. Damage control teams are stationed in a DC locker and will move from there when damage is taken. It'll take time for repairs to start as the teams need to get themselves and their tools to the casualty. You can see the progress of the damage control teams by the gauge filling up on their token. Hazards like fires are their first priority before they'll begin repairing actual damage, as these can deal damage over time. The important thing to remember is that once a component has taken damage below 90%, it can never be fully repaired back to 100%. Maximum repair is 10% more than the lowest integrity level the component had at the time of repairs. We'll let your teams work before we continue. Let's do two more drills. The first is a component restoration exercise. The CIC is now destroyed, with the integrity at 0%. Repair teams won't begin repairs to get it in operational again, without you explicitly telling them to do so. You'll need to get it repaired. In the damage control board, find the CIC and use left shift plus left click to order your repair teams to start working on it. Once it's repaired, the ship will be able to receive orders again. This must be done manually, because restoring a component is a time and equipment intensive process. The equipment to do so is stored in the DC locker, and each locker only holds enough materials for one or two restorations. Although the CIC is disabled and this ship can't receive orders to move or fire, you will always be able to prioritize damage control to attempt repairs. But this means that your repair teams are extremely vulnerable. They're moving into parts of the ship that are actively taking enemy fire and could very well be killed. If all the personnel on a team are killed in action, you'll lose the team completely. If you run out of repair teams, you won't be able to repair at all. You can't replenish teams outside of a port, so keep that in mind. We'll wait for your teams to finish their work, then we'll continue. Now that the CIC is restored, the Small Beginnings is ready to receive orders again. After the teams reboot all of the computers, that is. Lastly, we'll do something a little dangerous, a catastrophic scenario. Most component damage is localized, and will only affect the part of the ship where the damage was received. 
On the other hand, catastrophic scenarios are situations which, left unchecked, will eventually take the whole ship down. These situations include reactor overloads, magazine explosions, and fuel line fires, just to name a few. Your repair teams will automatically move to prevent catastrophic damage, so there's not much you can do except watch. Just get a feel for what it will look like. Your damage control officer will always prioritize repairs for a situation like this. The ship's survival always comes first. Notice the flashing warning icon in the ship's list. Below the icon is an estimated countdown before the situation gets out of control. If you don't know what's wrong, you can hover over the warning icon to see a tooltip. Out of all the catastrophic damage you might see, reactor overloads are the most deadly. Your teams know how to work with a damaged reactor, but fires and other hazards can make it a nearly impossible task to complete. Should the reactor go critical, you'll see a reactor bloom with a blast radius of about 1.5 kilometers. Standard doctrine states to move all of the friendly warships out of the danger radius in the ship with an impending reactor overload. Be careful around enemy wrecks as well. Your weapons could have damaged the reactor housings, and you'll get little to no warning before they go off. But Commander, that's it for your damage control trials. Just keep an eye on your teams and be smart about their movements and you'll come out just fine. Remember, the ship's survival always comes first.